practically every American public school, elementary students are taught about the solar system. As they memorize the planet's names and their planetary order, they are introduced to the heliocentric model of the universe, which places the sun at the center, which Earth and all the other planets revolve around. This theory is attributed to Nicholas Copernicus, a Polish scientist that coined the term the Copernican theory. However, would you be surprised to know that the data he collected was actually from his Greek forebears? In fact, he wasn't even the first to propose the heliocentric theory. In this video, we will discuss the Greek Copernicus, Aristarchus of Samos, who proposed the first heliocentric model of the universe. Aristarchus of Samos lived from approximately 310 to 230 BC, although the exact dates are unknown. He was a student of Strato and the third head of Aristotle's Lycum. However, historians have struggled to find reliable details about his life. Most of his scholarly pursuits were in the field of geometry and mathematics, but he is best known for his work in astronomy. Aristarchus was the first and the only ancient Greek philosopher to propose a heliocentric model of the universe. In about 260 BC, he proposed a model that featured the sun at the center of an immense sphere of stars. Earth and all the other planets moved around it in a circle. The sphere of the stars was motion motionless, and its apparent motion resulted from the Earth's daily rotation on its axis. While some antiquity figures such as Heraclitus of Pontus suggested that the Earth rotated every day, Aristarchus was the only scholar to say that the Earth changed positions. However, seldom any philosophers accepted his theory. In fact, his theory would not be seriously considered until the 16th century, 2,000 years later, when Copernicus published his own heliocentric theory in De Revolutionibus. Why did the ancient scientific community reject Aristarchus's theory? On one level, religious and social factors are to be blamed. It is clear that Aristarchus faced massive criticism for his theories. Although we do not have a lot of his original work, most of our sources can be found through one of his students, Archimedes, and also Plutarch. In Plutarch's work, he describes Aristarchus and his trial for impiety. He writes, Only do not, my good fellow, enter an action against me for impiety in the style of Clinthus, who thought it was the duty of the Greeks to indict Aristarchus of Samos on the charge of impiety for putting in motion the hearth of the universe, this being the effect of his attempt to save the phenomena by supposing the heaven remain at rest and the earth resolve in an oblique circle while it rotates at the same time about its own axis. Aristarchus was the last of the Pythagorean Brotherhood, which was a group persecuted because it went contrary to the Greek norms and their understanding of science and philosophy. But why were the Pythagoreans such a controversial group? It's important to understand Greek culture at the time. The Greeks believed the importance of good deeds and good works, and just the importance of human life. Therefore, the earth needed to be at the center of the universe so their works could matter. The Pythagoreans did not agree. The Pythagoreans were founded by Pythagoras, a Greek philosopher mathematician, and contributed to the developments of mathematics and Western rationale philosophy. Crucial to the Pythagoreans was their harmony of the spheres. The, the astronomy of the Pythagoreans marked an important advancement in ancient scientific thought, for they were the first to consider the Earth as a globe re revolving with the other planets around a central fire. They explained the harmonious arrangement of things as that of bodies in a single, all-inclusive sphere of reality, moving around to a numerical scheme. Because the Pythagoreans thought that the heavenly bodies are separated from one another by interval intervals corresponding to the harmonic lengths of strings, they held that the movement of the spheres gives rise to a musical sound, the harmony of the spheres. Pythagoras may have referred vaguely to the music of the heavens, which he alone seemed to be able to hear, 
and later, Pythagoreans seem to have assumed that the distance of the heavenly bodies from the Earth somehow correspond to musical intervals, a theory that, under the influence of Platonic conceptions, resulted in the famous idea of the harmony of the spheres. However, on a deeper level, although Aristarchus's heliocentric hypothesis was correct, it also had some major weak points. In this video, we will explore these weak points and their implications on the study of history and philosophy of science. First, we must evaluate scientific theories in terms of their historical context. We can't take them in isolation. Today, the heliocentric model is not a new or controversial thought, but in ancient Greece it was. All of their scientific theories and philosophies revolved around a stable Earth, as previously mentioned, and their rationale was not far-fetched. One reason the Greeks did not accept Aristarchus' theory was because they could not find any evidence that the Earth was in motion. They argued that if the Earth was in motion, they would be able to feel it. But how did the ancients expect to experience Earth's rotation? The Greeks believed that if the Earth rotated, there would have to be a persistent wind in the opposite direction to the rotation. In the 21st century, we know this is not the case. The Earth's atmosphere does not rotate with the Earth. But why did the Greeks think this? Imagine that you're taking a family road trip in your mom's SUV. You're going on a camping trip, so you decide to take your dog with you. Your dog love to, loves to stick its head out the window, so your mom opens the window. What do you experience? Do you feel the wind pressure that extends into the car? Does your hair push in front of your face? Can you hear the wind beating against the side of the car? All of these signal to you that you are in motion, but these phenomena stop when your mom parks the car. These ideas dominated the Greek rationale. Even if we are moving very slowly, there would be some kind of effect from the motion. And while the Greeks were aware that if the Earth truly did move, whether it be by spinning on its axis or orbiting the sun, that the speeds would be much greater than those they experienced in everyday transportation, they could not find evidence of any type of motion. Another reason the Greeks rejected Aristarchus's heliocentric model was that a moving Earth did not fit into the Greek account of why things fall to Earth and why the Earth holds together. The Greeks never developed a theory of gravity. They knew that objects fell, but they explained them in a different way. Similarly, Aristarchus's theory raised questions about the moon. If the Earth circled the sun, why did the moon follow the Earth around the cosmos? Again, today we can explain this by gravity, but given the Greek understanding of science, there was no reason the moon would circle a moving planet. The final objection against Aristarchus was the movement of the stars. If the Earth circled the sun, then the stars would appear to be in different positions at each end of the orbit. The shift does indeed occur, but it would not be until the invention of the telescope that astronomers could observe it. The shift is just extremely small due to Earth's immense distance from the stars. Today, we can use these slight shifts to measure the distance of certain objects in space. To understand why this works, hold up a pen in front of your eyes. Then, take turns opening and closing one eye at a time. The pen will shift right and left depending on which eye is looking at it, because your line of sight is originating from different locations. Now, keep doing this as you move the pen farther away from your face. The shift in location becomes less pronounced with greater difference. Now let's imagine that your right eye is where the Earth is to the right of the Sun, and your left eye is when the Earth is to the left of the Sun. A distant star will change its position in the sky, just like the pen, but the, the, but the star is so far away that scientists need precise tools to measure the shift. This is known as the annual stellar parallax. However, since the Greeks do not have any tools to measure this, they assume that the stars did not move and thus the Earth was stationary. Aristarchus attempted to deal with the parallax problem by comparing the Earth's orbit to the center of a sphere and the fixed stars to the surface of a sphere. This might mean that the cosmos is infinitely large, or merely that the size of Earth's orbit is incomparable or insignificant relative to the distance of fixed stars. However we take this, Aristarchus's hypothesis required a massively inflated cosmos, which the ancient Greek philosophers did not think was possible. Also, 
Aristarchus's proposal was rather simplistic. The Earth's orbit of the Sun is not a circle, but an ellipse. This is important because of, of a phenomenon known as the inequality of the seasons, which was well known to the ancient philosophers. For example, when we watch the sun set on the horizon, we can observe that it moves throughout the year. The northern and southern mo most points are the solstices, which are the days of maximum or minimum daylight. And the central point is the equinox, days of equal day and night. The seasons can be defined as the beginning from when the sun passes these points. We might expect the time taken for the sun to progress from solstice to equinox and equinox to solstice to be equal, but scientists have found that it's not, and the ancient Greeks knew this. This is actually because of the elliptical nature of the Earth's orbit. The inequality of the seasons had been discovered by two Athenian astronomers. The Earth-centered system of astronomy, created by Exodus and modified by Calypsus, predicted different lengths for the seasons. Aristarchus's hypothesis, however, predicted perfect equality of the season. Aristarchus's theory, while we know today is correct, was just a little too simplistic and it failed to account for a phenomenon that other ancient Greek systems could deal with. The reason why Aristarchus was largely ignored after his death and in fact didn't have any students to teach his theory to was the success of later Greek, helio or Greek Earth centered astronomy and cosmology. Apollinus and Hipparchus were, were instrumental in developing this system, which was brought to its highest point by Ptolemy. Although it was complex, mathematically it was very powerful, and it could give scientists a good account of the phenomenon. Not only did these astronomers and philosophers come up with plausible hypotheses, they greatly improved the predictive accuracy of observation as well. However, despite this, no evidence was found in favor of Aristarchus, and the absence of annual stellar parallax from his theory became even more and more glaring. In the Christian era, it became even more difficult to suppose that the Earth orbit in the sun, as the Bible seemed to contradict this. At Joshua 10:12, God orders the sun and the moon to stand still, in order to lengthen the day and allow the Israelites victory in battle. Also important to Christianity was the idea that man should be at the center of God's creation. Aristarchus wrote about his heliocentric theory in a treatise entitled On the Sizes and Distances of the Sun and Moon, which we still have today. While historians are unclear of the specific date, they speculate that it was written in 237 BC. Aristarchus produ produced a genius and original insight. However, it is incorrect to believe that the Greek geocentric astronomy and cosmology, while it was mistaken, was not sophisticated. And for ancient Greek times, it was very good at describing and predicting the motions of the cosmos and heavens. It would require much more than a simple statement of the heliocentric thesis to disprove it. And this was something Nicholas Copernicus found out many centuries later. When Copernicus revived Aristarchus' proposal, he did so in a much more sophisticated manner. But even then, it wasn't accepted. It still took the work of Galileo and Kepler, 70 years later, before the heliocentric theory became widely accepted in the scientific community. For the heliocentric theory to be accepted, it was necessary to create a new physics capable of dealing with the moving Earth, produce observational evidence, and overcome religious and social opposition. Aristarchus had no such able supporters.